takes yes. it a some time to yeah so i'm just curious what's that in your background on your left side is it boxes for dogs or yes yes crates oh. crates so we got <clears throat> we do uh like day training here mm -hmm. and we used to have wire crates but all the dogs using the floor it was, it was chaos too much noise so i got them built and they got all all holes drilled through the top so yep. dogs come out they work they go back and they sleep so we've got 10 crates there we can have 10 dogs in and you wouldn't even know that we got a dog in so they go in they sleep they come out for their for their work and then they go back so it's been awesome it's been awesome nice so for your day trains they come in in the morning and then they go back home at night yeah yeah so the basically between 7 30 and 5 30 um they can get dropped off from 7 30 like we've we're pretty much like a private club here. So I've got like coded doors, the alarm turns off. Uh, and, you know, if clients need to get here early, they can come in, let themselves in, put a dog away. They write their, their dog's name on, on the whiteboard on the crate. Um, same with, with pickup. If like they're going to run late, they're, hey, we're going to be 20 minutes, half an hour late. Yeah, no worries. Help yourself. Pick up the dog. All that sort of stuff. So um, cool. you know, once they get dropped off, oh, my seat's sinking here. Do Once they get dropped off in the morning, then uh, yeah, we got handlers that spend one on one time. So obviously, no free nice. for all. Uh, no free for all here. It's do all, the same uh, dogs come every day, or uh, no? We only do our day training on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, and then the way that we're set up is like everything is done on membership here. So you either do like a one one per week visit or a, a two time, uh, like a twice per week visit. Um, but all the single visits are on Wednesdays and then the double visits come on Fridays as well as Wednesdays. Nice. That's so good. Yeah. It, we're getting ready it, to transition into a day train. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah. So it's like, I'm sorry, man. I just, no, you I'm not a believer and I was sinking. Um, it's good. Like we don't, we don't really take on dogs, uh, because it's more like our daycare option, right? So it's not like a, our answer to a board and train as such. There's no real criteria that we train. So we really mainly focus on existing clients that send their dogs here for the day training. So it's a bit more of a, um, you know, a, a value add or uh, another th another layer to their training that we can, we can help maintain um, rather than just getting new dogs in that the owners don't know how we train or, or how to handle a dog. And then we're spending time with them. Then they're going home thinking, well, why can't I get my dog to do any of this stuff? It, it's just as important to um, yeah. you know, obviously get the clients educated on, on how to handle the dog as much as anything. But it's good. It's good. We've had a lot of good response because a lot of people have come to us for training that have either been to other trainers that have not been very successful with their dogs. Um, whether or not that's just from the skill of the trainer or, you know, as we all know, the limits of certain ideologies. Um, but also uh, the, the fact that um, people have had their dogs at free-for-all daycares and maybe they're a dog that has a little bit more substance and doesn't fit into that, that, that free-for-all type um, system. They've been able to come here and still have that outlet for, for their dog during the week. And they see... 10 times more results because the dog's getting proper productive time spent with a handler rather than just put in a pen with 20 other dogs for the day. So definitely a good, a good thing to have in your business. Oh, nice. But, but you also do board and trains, right? Or don't, don't you do that? Uh, I was doing board and train, um, but at the moment I kept a puppy from my last litter. So I got no room at my house to kennel any more dogs um so board and trains are currently off we are madly looking for some acreage me and my wife so we can go live the farm life and as soon as we get to acreage then we'll open up board and trains boarding again everything so uh you know living in the suburbs here we're a bit limited yeah and my one of my neighbors is uh he's a bit of a dick and he puts in lots of complaints to our council um so i just spent like the last 12 months with the council investigating my house because he's put in like three or four complaints. Um, 
and they said they found there's nothing to answer for. There's not an issue, but they won't let me have any more dogs. I've got four dogs on the property at the moment. So, yeah, we'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. So. All right. Cool. I think, yeah, I think we just start with our podcast for today. Uh, thanks for joining in, guys. Um, I'm Dominic, together with uh, my co-host, Mike. And we have a special guest today. And I think it's the best way if you just introduce yourself, right? Yeah. Well, my name is Daniel. I'm uh, from Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, it's not really a known state or, or city in Australia. We're down, we're down the bottom in the middle where you've got the ark uh, in, in the middle of Australia there. I've been a dog trainer now professionally for four years. Uh, I, was, I was a hobbyist before that. Um, and really, when I say hobbyist, it was, it was an interest to me. It's not like I was involved in any dog sports or anything like that. Just my pet dogs. Uh, I was always interested. Since my first dog, I had a pit bull, uh, a, a red-nosed um, pit bull terrier. For my first dog when I was 18, it was a cool thing at the time to have a pit bull, you know. So I went and got one and wanted to be the big badass with a red-nosed kitty walking around the streets um, and, and raised it totally wrong. You know, and yeah. it, it just turned out to be a total mess of a dog. Uh, he was good. He was a good dog if it was just me and him in a room. <laughs> but anything outside of that, uh, he, he was nuts. He wanted to kill anyone and everything. And I ended up having to put him down when he was six. His name was Caesar. And um, it was one of the worst days of my life, uh, really, that I had to put him down because although – all of his negatives, you know, we, we had a really strong connection and he was with me through some pretty shit times in my life. And basically I used the human thought process uh, of not knowing dogs properly at the time and thought, well, the way that I'll fix his his dog aggression anyway is I'll go get another dog because all, all everyone loves a puppy, right? So yeah. I've got a, a German Shepherd pup. That was my first German Shepherd. And... Um, he ended up attacking her when she was eight weeks old. And we spent a few days with the muzzle on, crates, you know, always keeping separate. And he was showing no interest in her. And then one day the pup was laying on my chest while we were watching TV. He was laying on the floor. And uh, I went to give him a piece of chicken. And the pup woke up from her sleep and just went to sniff the chicken. And he just latched onto her and started throwing her around the room. And, yeah, it was uh, that moment – we had about a three year toxic relationship before that, you know, it was, it was almost, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain the, the sickness yeah. in my stomach that I used to feel from this dog sometimes. And, and that was a final straw for me. So I, um, I chucked him in my study after I pried him off of the, uh, the German shepherd, I chucked him in the study, he got to eat the whole chicken as his last meal. And then I, I went and put him down and, I said to myself that day, I'll, I'll never be in a situation where I'll have a dog that has these issues again, and I'll never make this decision again to one of my own dogs. Um, mm. So it started a journey for me, it lit the fire, and I just started researching. And, you know, at the time, my research kind of started with uh, watching a lot of Caesar Milan <laughs> back, back, what, 10, 10 or so years ago, you know, that was kind of the thing. And um, then it just expanded from there, really, really. So um, that's me, Daniel. I um, I'm now up to dog number dog number eight, I think. Oh, really? You have yeah. eight dogs? No, no. This number eight. I've had eight oh. dogs. Right? Oh. So I've got four dogs at home at the moment. But yeah, um, and I, I look forward to getting another one. I would have more tomorrow if I could restart the process, put it all into practice again. Um, so yeah, in, about four years ago, I started uh, started my professional dog training uh, journey. I got my first working dog, Tira. Um, she's now the mother of uh, the, the first litter I had last year. And we got another litter due next month. Um, and I've got Arco, who's my Belgian Malinois. He is he's something else. He's, he's my best mate. He's a very cool dog. He's where I've been able to put a lot of things into practice that I've learned, especially in the Nepo post system. Um, and now I've got uh, also Rogue is my German Shepherd puppy. 
She's 10 months old, but she's being developed for a government agency is, is the hope to be able to get her to that level and sell her on. So that's me. Awesome. So what's, um, what's jumping in Australia? What's the, what's the dog climate look like there? The training climate, let me ask. Let me ask. Yeah. Well, it's growing, and it's good to see that it's growing. Um, it's, it's probably becoming a lot more popular, which is good, and I think worldwide dog training is getting a bit of a, a spotlight put on it, no matter how, how that spotlight is being put on it. There seems to be a lot more people getting into dog training. Um, I think that that's both good and bad uh, because almost every day I open up my Facebook and there's a new yeah. dog walker slash trainer uh, that's just, you know, opened up a business and I can take your dogs for walk and I can train them. And uh, you can see some of these people, you know, they'll go pick up like four, five, six dogs and take them out off leash and all this sort of stuff, but they've got no qualifications. They don't know dogs yeah. is like okay so that's that's kind of a, a dangerous side that i see appearing but as a whole i think like the standards are really starting to raise here which is good uh, because obviously out of the the majority you're always going to have people that rise to the top and push the bar um so that's good in adelaide where i'm from it is again growing uh, there's not too many of us that uh you know really really kicking goals here um but like i said it's 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 new it's new and um, there's a lot of people that are getting into it and i'm sure that they're going to grow and it's kind of my mission anyway to create a bit of a community here because when i was coming up um and learning it just felt very closed off and there was no one really to reach out to and people didn't want to really help you um take that next step up through insecurity or whatever i don't know um so i'm just trying to do what i can do to to create a bit of a community here so we can all help each other because the better we keep each other to a higher standard yeah. uh, the better it is for for all the clients and the dogs really yeah. and that's why we do it at the end of the day um so yeah as as for like dog sports and stuff like that here we've got a and kc obedience is everywhere which is like your equivalent of akc uh, in america um and there's one one dog sport club here for IGP, uh, and that's it. So whether or not uh, consider starting another club or doing something, we kind of got like a little group that catches up at the moment, um, and everyone's interested in a different type of uh, discipline, whether it's agility or obedience or you know bite work or whatever. So my idea in in that sense is to let's just get like minds together and we can all help each other get yeah. to wherever we want to go. We don't have to be an IGP, uh, IGP club or a PSA club or whatever. We can all just help and, and work towards people, people competing in wherever they want to go. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it's like. And, and here, like everywhere, we're starting to feel the, the ripples of, um, of the, uh, you know, the, the, the tool bands and, you know, all this I ideology warfare that's going on around the world at the moment. <clears throat> but the one thing which I notice here especially is that you don't see any evidence. I can't speak for in Germany or America, but these people that are preaching that the way that we train is uh, abusive or it's bad for the dog or anything, and they say that you can do all these things, all you see is pictures. Yeah. You know, so... I'm very much against it. And that doesn't matter if you're horse free, positive only, balanced or whatever. Any dog trainer in this day and age, if you got a if you kind of got a Facebook page or, or or a website and it's only pictures, to me that's a little bit of a red flag. Well, and not only not only it I think that's the same everywhere. It's not just pictures either, because you can take um I've seen it recently a lot. Um, and I won't call them out by name, but there's a couple locally. Um, I will call them out pretty soon enough, but not <laughs> just not today. Um, I'm working on a post, but I want it to be right. Yep. But you'll see videos even where there's no sound and there's music. And as a dog trainer, you can look at that. If you're, first of all, 
if if you're not an analytical person, if you're not a logical person, if you can't think through issues, if you're not the type of person that can that enjoys looking at something and breaking it down, then you shouldn't be a dog trainer. You know, you should yep. do something that is a mind, you know, doesn't take a mind to do. Um, yep. But so, uh, you know, a legitimate dog trainer will watch these videos and I've seen them recently and I just have a couple on my mind right now as, as I'm saying this, but they, you can tell that they said sit and the dog down, or you can tell that they said down and the dog, you know, I think we lost it. No, but the vo the vo the sounds taken away. There's music overlaid, and yeah. then um, it's a uh, and then you know the assault on um, my computer just did something. This the assault against uh, tools, you know, and I'm seeing a I'm seeing a lot of trainers that use tools being intimidated and trying to. Uh, I even hate to, I hate to use the word, but crossover, you know, yeah. um, and so that all to me, all that means is you're taking your whole brain and you're you're cutting it in half and throwing half of it in the garbage because now you're just a moron, you know. Um, <laughs> that's just the way I see it, but it uh, we'll I, see. I think that, sorry, go on. No, yeah, that's it. That's my soapbox. Yeah. I think I think that uh, I definitely feel that that is also the case. At least I can only speak for for the city that I'm from, anyway. But I think that it would kind of generalise to the dog training community is that there is a lot of what we call balanced trainers or, or people that use tools, whatever, um, that are afraid to show that stuff because they fear the cancel, cancel culture coming. Yeah. Because when when uh, you know maybe you're you're a bit of a, a smaller dog trainer or you've got a small business whatever you know losing one or two clients out of that because of that that's that's a lot of your bottom line so I've always been of the the mindset where it's like this is me take it or leave it if you don't like it get out right so um, I kind of took the um, the stance of well I'm not going to be one of those people that gets shut down because of the fear of cancer culture. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a couple of other businesses behind me. So my, my, my livelihood doesn't solely rely on dog training. Um, and I thought, well, if, if there's no one else really stepping up to the plate in that regard, uh, where I'm from, not that it's, it's my fight alone to cause, but I need to start just putting stuff out a little bit more and showing people the other side and, uh, recently, I've been putting a few videos of the uh, Rogue, my, my pup, uh, doing some prong collar work and people just like, well, well, the dog doesn't look scared, doesn't look distressed. Yeah, of course it doesn't, right? You know, I, I say people like the prong collar to me is like I'm an archaeologist brushing off the bones, you know, very gentle, very gentle. I can I can just fine tune little things. Um so it's good to be able to show that side of things and, and people have a, a difference of opinion whether or not that's enough to make a difference because we're going to have the political fight here soon. It's starting to gear up. The RSPCA has already um, put out their intentions to change the Animal Welfare Act in the city that we're from or in the state that we're from. Um, and, and one of the, the headlining things on that is uh, to get the prong collar banned. Um and, and that alone, you know, the, the kind of bullshit that they write in their emails out to their, their email list, because I'm on the email list, uh, saying, you know, prong, col prong collars cause swelling of the head and uh, blindness in dogs, you know, all this sort of yeah. stuff. And it's, it's like, nonsense. Well, yeah. where's your evidence? But then again, the more that I kind of interact with the dog world and, you know, coming to... Um, see more than the dog world that's just in Adelaide. Like, I really don't think that there's enough of, you know, the new age dog training with tools out there. So everyone is, their mindset is stuck back in the day where we can all agree that it was fairly heavy handed back then, 30, 40 years ago plus. Um, so really it's up for, for everyone that's kind of taking part now. They have to bite the bullet a little bit. And the more that we have numbers putting good work out, uh, the more hopefully that we'll, we'll be able to persuade our side of things. And there is there is maybe a small community, you know, like we, 
uh, in the way that we train, in the style that we train. We may be the 2% of the dog training community, but we're still a community that, that uses these tools and we do it very well. You know, but, so. but you know what the problem is that uh, there are a lot of people out there or I mean, especially in Germany saying uh, there are a lot of clubs that still train like in the old days, like 30, 40 years ago. And that is, in my opinion, that's dog abuse. And mm. that's why these people are so on to ban those tools because they are just a small group of people abusing dogs or animals with these tools. And that's mm. that's a big problem. Yeah, but they don't see any different. Yeah, the, the people wanting the ban. That's what they see, and then oh, that's sure. uh, that's that's not force free training, or that's not positive only training. So that's uh, that's balanced training. There's good and bad training. That's it. Yeah. There's no force free. There's no positive only. You're either a good dog well, trainer or you're bad. And and I would even argue, and you know, there's people that would debate me on this, but I would argue that m more abuse and the worse abuse comes from the uh, quote unquote purely positive side of training, honestly, because you build up dogs to be happy and to be energetic, you know, and then, but when it's time for a correction, what, you know, you have to give the dog, you have to speak to a, the dog in a language that the dog don't understand. And so you're, you're jumping straight to a punishment that's, um, that's not necessary if you would have taught the dog, you know, correctly from the beginning and yeah. um you know it uh you're not you can't purely pop you're not going to train a dog throughout its career whether that's a four-week board and train or whatever you know the case may be but you're not going to train a dog and and purely positive methods i don't even like saying that because i feel like it's oxymoronish but if you if you um on camera you can do it it's fine you can show the snapshots and the highlight moments but behind the scenes if you're correcting that dog um you're probably doing it in a way that's not um you see the videos you know you can call them out by name you can look at um victoria stillwell and and those and even zach george when you see him jerking on a leash you know um i mean come on right you know i could but you can it's sensationalism and emotionalism. It's all about the words you say and people will uh, feelings and emotion trumps logic every time because yeah. feeling and emotion doesn't take time to process. It's just like, you know, you can trigger somebody's emotions real fast, but it takes at least a few seconds to get them to think about something. And people don't mm -hmm. have a few seconds, you know, they're scrolling to the next, you know, it, uh, I saw a, um, a, a Zach George video, uh, and I hate even saying his name because Facebook's probably listening, and now I'm going to have Zach George <laughs> pop up in my newsfeed all day. Uh, but uh, he, he had a video talking about what he does. He was at the beach, and what he does if his dog doesn't come back on a recall, and he gives a second command to stay. So he was like, I'll be walking on the beach and my wife is 200 meters up, up, uh, up that way or, and uh, my dog's there and I call my dog and my dog decides not to come back. Then I tell it, stay. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Like that, that <laughs> just shows total lack of control. You shouldn't even have your dog off leash. <laughs> like, well, what you yeah. That's so, not even logical yeah. because a stay is a static command and the dog is – is if you're telling a dog to stay, typically the, the dog's required to do nothing, which is less likely than telling the dog to come, which puts the dog's mind on actually doing something. Mm -hmm. It's easier for a dog to do something and to stay on track for it to do nothing and stay on track. So his yeah. whole logic, he's just, you know, they can't, like I said before, you got to be able to think and th those people can't think. All they can do is, talk on on video with that charismatic sort of yeah. i'm your buddy and you know and that wins people and that's the problem mm. is it wins people so yeah. yeah so i think like you know it's it's really to a point where yeah we need to as a community do what we can i mean there's like there's a lot of discussion about it the problem is and even in australia here there's been a since 
like in Queensland, which is a state up north, they 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 started. Uh, well, they actually banned a prong collar probably a few months ago now, maybe within the last six months. And they went through the whole political process, but the problem is, is that even the government blindsided the whole dog training community because they said that they went to public consult consultation, but they actually didn't. No one mm -hmm. from the dog community was approached. It was a backdoor deal that it turns out sure. with the Animal Rights Party, whatever it was. Sure. Um, so now they've got a rule in place, and you can't quote me because I don't really follow Queensland law, but it's a, it's something uh, around the fact that you cannot have a prong collar on the dog unless you have a legitimate use or a legitimate reason for doing so. It's like, I mean, yeah. that's... A yeah, it's a, okay. So legitimacy is pretty subjective, so unless you're going to give some guidelines around that. Um, but, you know, it's it's... Yeah, so are you, are you doing it to appease the political parties? What was the point of spending all those hundreds of thousands of dollars putting this bill through Parliament and now you've still got what you had in the first place but you've just got an extra sentence written in the... Yeah, yeah. It, it's stupid. But um, I think that uh, what, what this group of... It's called the um, Professional Dog Trainers Association and they're, they're new... They're going to start, um, you know, calling for membership dues, which is good, right, because they're putting fights to to Parliament. But I think there needs to be a little bit more from the dog training community to kick some funds into fighting this rather than there's a lot of people like us right now sitting on a podcast, talking, speaking our mind, which is good because we need to spread the word as well. But at the end of the day, without money, you're not going to fight this stuff in court and you're not going to be able to get any further than kind of bitching and moaning about it so yeah um yeah that's that's, true. that's 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 where we're at um and that's that's going to be tough it's going to be tough because again when you when you look at community as a whole even though we can see stuff like even bite sports are, are good for dogs it's hard for people to see how doing that is good for a dog yeah. You know, if they see that as why would you want that aggressive, vicious dog in society that's going to go bite people? You're teaching it to bite people. Now it's going to bite me or my kid when I'm walking down the road next to you and all that. They, they just they don't get it. So yeah. education, yeah. education, and and bringing as much to light as possible is is where yeah. we need to go. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so let's talk about, and I I want to get your perspective. Um, on uh, you know the new silver school, uh, the next one is coming up actually this this week. It starts yep. uh, Thursday, I believe. So let's get your uh, tell us about your experience at the at the first new gold school silver. So, school. so what you're gonna say first is that we we all met in in Springfield, Missouri, at the Bass Pro Shop the first time um, yeah. where you went flying into the new silver school or the first new silver school. So I don't know if the people know that. Yes. So, uh, well, man, I've been trying to uh, get to do the Nipopo silver and gold for ages. Um, and then COVID happened, right? And then the last gold school was announced. I actually wrote to my government three or four times asking for a travel exemption so I could get to the States. Uh, because I wanted to make the last uh, silver and gold that was an offer and that didn't happen. So I was a bit distraught and uh, a bit upset about that. But, you know, we were going through COVID. I even uh, was messaging Michael Bellin a few times and, hey, come on, there's got to be a way I need to do this. What's going to happen? And then as soon as I saw uh, well, late last year, the, the new – or late last year or early this year, new silver school – Mate, it was 24 hours and I was messaging Sophie, I'm in, let's go. Um, so, yeah, it, it was good to, to, to get back and have a, have a chance of that. But where, where I was probably a few months before, I did uh, Hans came to Australia and I did his seminar, right, uh, last November. And that seminar to me was, was life-changing in terms of my dog training mindset. Because up until that point, I'd done a lot of um, online coaching with people around the world um, and, and around Australia. 
and I took stuff out of those those uh, coaching calls and and consults. But until I was at Hans's seminar, it was almost like that that click and everything just banded together. So the timing for me to go to Silver School, it, you know, the universe provides because I think that if I'd gone sooner, I don't think I would have been ready to to actually take on the points or or excel. So um, going going in March this year to to Silver School, it again had reinforced a lot of the stuff that I had been learning about Nipopo and taking from different Nipopo students or, or graduates, I should say, um, and and hearing it from the source, you know, to sit there and listen to Bart for three days or the, I could listen to him and his accent for weeks, right? The first time I heard uh, heard Bart was on the canine paradigm and I was there was an instant attraction. You know, there's some people that are very big in the dog training world and I can't listen to them for more than two minutes. Right. You know, and that's a very important thing when you're getting information from someone, you, you need to be engaged and not only uh, the way that Bart delivers information, uh, like I said, his accent, it's a little bit pleasing to listen to. Um, so it, I, and I don't know if it's, the, you know, the same with Hans when I was at his, his seminar and Hans said to me, Daniel, it's because my English is terrible. I only say the important stuff. You know, so all, all, all what we call here in Australia, all the waffle, it, it, the, the, the waffle copter is out the window. So all the important information comes through. So, yeah, having said that, Silver School reinforced a lot of stuff for me. Um, was it, uh, you know, it was not a lot of, well, there was still new stuff. It's not like I was learning it for the first time. So for me, like I said, it was reinforcing. But being there in the room, uh, was more important to me and the networking was hands down amazing. I think on the first day uh, when we went to register and I saw Bart and Michael standing there, I felt like I was backstage at a rock and roll concert. I was like, these are people I've only seen online. And now, you know, Bart just came up to me and started talking to me like we'd known each other for years. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, so to be able to, again, have this feeling of connection um to Nipopo as a system, but then to the international dog training community made me feel that, you know, it is a little bit more reachable uh, because in a well, where I'm from, again, there's not, there's not that connection with, with much of the dog training industry. Um, but going through the process uh, of the three days with, with, with the, uh, the structure that the, the seminar was, Man, it was very digestible information. I think that's the best, the best thing about it. And I don't, I can't speak for the old Silver School. I think it was over five days, was it? Yes. Five days. Um, so I don't know if it was just a, um, if there was information that was cut down, whether it was a better deliverance of the information. Um, but it was very much to the point, and the way that you know, being having the testing there and all that sort of stuff. I walked away from that and it was all just implemented, right? So I don't have to think about it. And and to to have this now analytical diagnostic system in my head when it comes to looking at behavior, again, that just put the final points on and coming home from that, the way that that changed my training, you know, like we're up and running now, uh, you know, the way that I can think about something that I want to build in my dog and just think about that in my head of how I'm going to go about it, analyzing sessions in the moment, everything. You know, you know, I kind of use the analogy. I feel like I've finally got my black belt in dog training, and you know, a lot of people think, "Oh, black belt is like that's good." Oh, yeah, you know, black belt means that uh, oh, you're you're cool. Nah, nah, black belt means that you just start the journey again, right? Yeah. And and now I feel that I've taken all the information over the past four years. Um, and now I can sort of give it my own flavor and I can, I can make it my own. Um, and, and that's what I'm excited doing, building and, and working with my dogs at the moment. I think there was a little bit of time there where I had too much information and I paralyzed myself with it because, um, you know, I overthink everything and try and over plan and strategize. And then through fear of not having the perfect outcome, I would avoid it. 
but then still in my head yeah. I'd be doing mind laps. Let's yeah. go, like, how are we going to do it? No, nah, I'm not going to do it today. No, nah, I'm not going to do it today. And now it's just like, yeah, it's just a bit of feeling. Go into it. Sometimes I'll, I'll set up a session. I might put the jump out, for example. Yeah, we're going to work on the jump today. And then one of my dogs shows me something and I'll be like, I don't like the way you did that. And now the whole session just revolves around that one little section of training. And yeah, I just feel like I've hit my flow. And, and that definitely came uh, after Hunter Seminar and then Silver School to back that up. Um, it's, it's been awesome. So what about a gold school? What gold school do you have in mind? Who's I'm sure somebody's in Australia. Yeah, we got we got Ben Gertz, who is a multiplicator. He's in Western Australia. Um, but I kind of have uh, you know another little fanboy crush on Hans. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, well, hey, if there's uh, chemistry, then that's good, you know. Well, you know, like I I, I see it in the fact that he he took. He took the the uh, the blindfold off for me in such a big way that I want to keep that that mentorship education yeah. uh, with him. Um, and like he's a cool dude. We we got yeah. a good friendship. We talk to each other like every few days. We're messaging each other. So um, yeah, I'd, and that's not to say anything against Ben, but I, I just that's where I want to go. And again, taking it back to a little bit of the the martial martial arts analogy. Um, type thing i see the lineage of information is kind of cool and the fact that hans has been with with bart for so long um you know you, you yeah you got your your master and then the grandmaster the next step up and it's it's more of a direct lineage to the source again so that's that's kind of my thought process so hopefully uh, well not hopefully we're planning um sometime early next year for hans to so you're coming to belgium to right no, I wanted to go to Belgium, but I need my own dog to do the gold school. So Hans is going to come out here, I think. Mm, awesome. Good. Don't quote me on that because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to disclose any of that information yet. But that's the, the, the mild uh, thought process is to, to bring him out here and, um, yeah, we, we'll do a gold school here. So going back to your, to your thought of um, um, taking away the two days from the silver school, so, uh, so I was there too. So I can I can say that they're all the, that you guys got all the same informations that we also got. So in the three days, it was a little bit more. In my just my opinion, yeah? it was a little bit more compressed information. That's why also some people felt sometimes it was just too much, a little bit too much information given. And uh, also another factor is that we were like. 20 people 25 in our silver school yeah and now it's it was up to 100 and we did some things like speaking in front of the class explaining what you just heard and that's just not possible uh within when you have 100 people sure. mm. also the role playing the role games mm. it's just not the same with 25 or 100 people so right. you can't do that in that like we did well, and, and asking questions too, like yeah. when we went over the test, um, it was, even though it was the same rules, really no questions, um, it, everybody's got, uh, you know, it is Terrible. rule breakers, I guess, but there's more opportunity to interact in class. You know, if you have 150 people in a room, you can't, you just can't because, you know, you would need. With that many people, you would need two weeks, probably two or three weeks to go through all the questions. So they I just think, uh, yeah, well, I think a positive, uh, well, positive spin from, from my outlook. Yeah, we may, may have not had that direct um, opportunity of, of discussion with Michael and Bart, but what it did was it formed little clusters in the room. So those people that you were sitting with or attending with, uh, the people behind you, the people in front of you, you, you started to converse with them a little bit. So then you've got, oh, what's his perception of, the, of that point that was just made? Or how do you take this? Or this is my opinion. And, you know, so it just right. created a little bit more networking, uh, networking among, yeah. among the students. Well, yeah. And you've got 20 grads, you know, gold grads that are there too to kind of help out with, you know, um, you know, sometimes the same question can be read two or three different ways, but you really, you have to apply it to the system and it's, 
sometimes, you know, just having somebody else that already has been through that question, not that they understood it when they went through it too, but mm. they've already, you know, made been, been to that mile marker and have, um, you know, have had the understanding. So it's easy to, I just said a whole lot that I didn't have to say, didn't I? That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what about, what about the, the experience, um, the food? Did you enjoy that? Man, I still every now and again think about the biscuits. The biscuit. <laughs> I like I'm a foodie, man. I used to be a big guy, so I'm uh, at my heaviest. I was about 135. I've always been a, a lover of food, and I used to be a chef. Everything. So if there's something good, like I can tell my my wife memories from my life based on the food that I ate at that time. Right, so I'm a little bit weird that way, but yeah, I still every now and again will just be like, "Man, those biscuits look good." Like, <laughs> I'm gonna try and make them one day, but I won't. I don't think I'll be able to make them as good as they were. Um, but yeah, the the food was good. Coffee, I'm sorry, coffee was not great. No, Next uh, time, what, I'm bringing yeah. my own coffee. Um, but to be honest, I don't know if America gets coffee like we do down here. Uh, yeah, we're kind of sores, man. We go through coffee. But it, it really it wasn't that good of coffee though. It, nah. it really wasn't. So, so um, yeah, like yeah, we 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 have very good coffee here. But I haven't found coffee anywhere outside of Australia that matches coffee really? from home. And that could be for everyone because that's just what you're used to. But um, I think so. Ah, yeah, just it was it was hard hard with the coffee. But what can you do? Apart from that, so, the so the location was amazing, right? It, like I said, it was cool to go to a different part of America, not being in a big city. Um, very bizarre to see such a flat, a flat city, and it's hard because America is so big compared to where we're from. So I think, I think Missouri or Springfield, Missouri, was their population about a million? Oh right. no, no Springfield's, no. yeah, Springfield's not really that big now. If you go up north a little bit to a couple hours north, uh, Kansas City is a is a is a lot bigger but uh springfield there's not that many really no, a couple hundred thousand. i thought i read a couple hundred thousand when i rocked up but i thought so i think i think my taxi driver my taxi driver's name was pork chop yeah i saw yeah. you posted that yeah <laughs> yeah pork chop i'm like yeah. how'd you get that name he's like oh well i did some time in prison i was like jesus <laughs> okay. let me get out yeah, I was like, all right. No, he was cool, man. He was cool. He picked me up every day, took me back to my hotel every day, airports, and, man, he recommended some good barbecue, all that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, uh, he, I, I think he told me it was about a million, but maybe I was wrong. Yeah. But my state you're actually, where I'm You're actually – it's actually on the top of a – it's a massive plateau on the top of a mountain range. So oh, really? It's really? Yeah, it's really flat there, but – you're you're on the top of the uh, I think it's the Ozark Mountains there. So you're actually right in the middle of a mountain range, but the plateau yeah. is so the plane's so big that it makes it feel like you're on you know you're on the bottom. Yeah. So I mean, like, yeah, I've, I've, I don't think I've been to a, such a flat city in terms of like even the size of buildings. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's more of a town. Yeah. Yeah, so like you know, everything is about three three stories, four stories, and then yeah. you know, again, being very plain in yeah. terms of what's around, and then seeing this huge bloody Bass Pro. That's the only thing like, that's there. Oh, that's yeah. that's huge. Yeah, like I couldn't believe it. Like we went in uh, the first day we went in when we came to, and we ended up having lunch with you, Dominic, and and the others. Um, and Hans is like, oh yeah, we're just in the gun shop. Uh, okay, so we went to the gun shop. The gun shop's bloody as big as Kmart or, or Target, you know, like we big department store just for guns. It's unbelievable. So very, very well done. The the amount of stuff that they had there, they yeah, just couldn't believe how big that that Bass Pro was. Yeah, it's pretty fun. So good. It's, it's cool that it's dog friendly too. Like if you live there, you know, it's a good place to take your dogs and, and to train, to socialize, especially if it's hot outside. So we're... We're just about out of time, um, but I do want to, and I know we touched on it already, um, but one more question, and I'll, Dom, you can ask it, 
I guess. Yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, you, you train dogs before the school, Naples Post School, and all that. But I'm always curious how the the the, the the school or how the knowledge passed over at the school changes your way of training. Is it is it more that you just think more or you understand more or how did that affect your training? Yeah, well, I think that it's it's I definitely train more now because I feel like I'm in a place where I'm getting results and you know sometimes I have to hold myself back. Now nah, the dogs deserve a day off today, but I'm still sitting there going, let's go. Like I want to rock it. Uh, maybe we'll just go do a ball session at the park. And then it turns into a full on training session, you know? So, um, but in terms of, uh, of that, I feel, I feel free from my thoughts because like I said before, I was overthinking everything. And now I just go with the flow so much, so much more. Um, as I mentioned before, I can be mid session, see something that I want to work on uh, or, or that I'm not liking and just totally change that direction. So it, all, it comes from feel, you know, and I feel that I can, I can, I can see everything to such a deeper level now. Uh, whereas before everything was again, a great quote from Hans that changed my, my, my dog training was train behavior, not exercises. Right. So once we look into into what the dog is offering rather than the overall or not the, not the overall big picture but if we can focus more on how the dog is doing stuff and and picking those little bits of behavior rather than well i tried to do the jump it was either right or wrong right what part can we pull out of that that the dog did well and and stretch that into a bigger piece of behavior yeah. um Oh, it, it just changed my my relationship with the dogs. I wasn't so frustrated with my dogs anymore because you know it's not ah oh, you, you know you stuff it up again or whatever. Like I could take more on as a coach and be like, oh, actually, what you just did there, I like. Let's get more of that out. How can I set stuff up to get more of that out? And then we can we can bring that across to the exercise of jumping. Um, so in terms of in terms of. Uh, that yeah, like I feel free from from all the thinking with my my students. I feel now I can take all that information that was in my head and deliver it to them in a much clearer clearer way. And and we've got a process to do things um, in terms of how we take Nipopo and deliver that to the pet dogs. Officially, we don't train Nipopo until I get my gold school and I can put the uh, the thing up. But in terms of training, um, training to the to the students, it's like I don't teach any certain way of dog training here. I teach you dog training. So if you want to be a positive only trainer, you can come here and do positive only stuff. Right? That's cool. That's no problems. We we show you the different tools that you have as a dog trainer, the different principles learning theories, all that sort of stuff. And it's up to you to find what what gets the best out of your dog. And if you go into it thinking, okay, well, no, like, you know, I want to I want to be a positive only trainer. Yep, that's cool. But if you're not getting the results, you have to you have to be aware of that. Or even if you were, were doing it another way and you were doing Nepo post style or uh, you know, straight straight uh, negative reinforcement training with your dog you have to be able to pick what is working and what is not working. And that's, that's where I feel that I deliver this information to my, my um, pet dog students is about how to be a dog trainer more so than how to train that dog, if that makes sense. Um, so very much about the how and, and, and the why. And then that, that gives them these analytical points that they can keep in their mind and the better that they get, the longer that they train, they can handle these situations a little bit better because they're not stuck in, well, my dog's not taking food, but it's reacting to that dog. Well, I'm just shit because that's how they're made to feel. Unfortunately, you know, I had, yeah. had a student here last week um, who came from another trainer. She said like all that trainer did was tell me that I broke my dog. Didn't give me any solutions. But that's someone who won't won't do anything except for treat train. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely given a lot more well roundedness to to my whole product, and that's why now I feel 
from being in my flow uh, and, and finding my groove with it all, I'm ready to take my brand out there a little bit more and put myself out there because I'm, I've got confidence. And uh, not only can I talk about it and, and explain what I'm doing now, but I can also show that I'm getting the results. So I'm not someone that's just talking. You yeah, can that's see very the important. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think the biggest, the biggest, um, <clears throat> well, the best thing for me that happened probably again within the last six months was I. And this sounds pretty contradictory as a as a dog trainer and a coach, but I detached myself and my my self value as a dog trainer. I detached that from the results that people get, because before I was like, well, if this person's not doing it, then it means that I'm bad. But I can't control what that person does outside of this venue, right? So as soon as I kind of came to that, thought, well, it doesn't mean that what I'm saying is not correct it doesn't mean that what i'm showing them and teaching them is not correct but if they walk out that door and don't do anything with that dog and come back next week and tell me they've done the homework i can't control that yeah. so the only thing i can control is my own dogs they're yeah. the ones that i can show everything this is my system of training this is the results it gets i can show my dogs down at the mall right the shopping mall inside out all different areas, uh, high drive, low drive. And if I can show all of that and the proof is in the pudding, then I must know something about what I'm talking about. Yeah, and that's, that's sure. what I tie, tie my, my, my level of success to. And that's why I, I'm loving it even more because, uh, you know, I can, I can show that stuff. Now this year is time for me to compete um, and, and get other people to tell me that I can show that stuff. <laughs> right, so that's that's the goal um and the way that i'm training with arco my malinois like man it's in a very generalist way i heard you uh you kind of mentioned uh, dominic in the the interview with inez about uh you know if you if you've got a dog that's only ever going to do igp you can be you can have a dog that's a, a little bit more closed-minded because it's always repetitive the, yeah. the routine but my look of it and my goal is to create a dog that's so well generalized that I can now narrow it down to a certain criteria and he can just do it because he knows. Sure. Right? So, sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I plan to do, especially with Arco, I plan to do uh, a BH this year and also go and do some A and KC trialing um, and just go and start, start dojo storming. Uh, relate everything back to the martial arts. You know, uh, uh, come in. Okay, we, this is the game today. Let's go. Nice. If I get my title, I get my title. If not, we try hard, harder and do it again. But All the best of luck eh, for your trials. Yeah, today. thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, so, I think um, I enjoyed the conversation. I think that you're a good – you're a, you're an asset to the flock. Is that a good Is that a good way of describing that? i take anything. But, you know, somebody who takes it takes training seriously and – really enjoys the application, but also the, um, you know, the theory part of it, the technical aspect of it is, um, it's always appreciated, so. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. It'd be nice to have you back on too, after maybe, um, maybe after gold school, you can come yes. back on and we'll talk about that. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely, I would love to. I appreciate you having me on and- uh, Yeah, sure, thanks for coming. Yeah. Apart from the the time difference, it, it's it's been great. <laughs> what time is it where you are now? Now it's twenty past five in the morning. Oof. Oh man, Damn. that's wow. okay. Well, it's all good. No time hey, to rest now. <laughs> hey, the opportunity to talk, uh, it, it's well worth it. You know. Thank you. Sometimes we have to have good struggle, right? Yeah. So, yeah. A little bit of stress is a good way of learning. Huh? That's, That's the right. name. My wife will tell you I'm not a morning person at all. So the fact that my <laughs> alarm went off and I was out of bed and out the door, it uh, it was good. Uh, so I, I appreciate the opportunity. And, um, yeah, whenever, I would be happy to come back on and talk. It's, it's awesome. a topic that we can talk for hours. So. Awesome. Sure. All right, Danny. Thanks again. Well, appreciate Thank it. You. And Have see you great. next time. Huh? See thanks for joining us, guys.